Thank you. Well, let me just start off by apologizing to you all. Um, for Christmas, I received a head cold, so I'm a little stuffy and then very loopy, so I'm going to try to stay as, as focused as possible. So yes, my name is Lori Nix, and um, I've been uh, working in photography since probably 19... 88, but that's including my grad school years, and I'm just going to go over a few of the of the bodies of work. And I don't know if any of you guys are familiar with my work, so I'll try to make this. You know, usually I talk to universities where the students are forced to look at stuff before the the speaker. Um, so. Myself and my partner Kathleen, who's not here tonight, we build tabletop dioramas. So we build models on our, you know, desks and then photograph the results. And this all, st and I started this back in 1997. I started this body of work called Accidentally Kansas. And it's about my childhood growing up in rural western Kansas. And the way I actually got to this body of work was a long time ago. I went to the Museum of Contemporary Arts in Chicago and I saw this photographer, Richard Mizrock. Richard Mizrock has had a long career um, exploring the desert, going there for 20 years plus, photographing all of the different aspects of man's impact upon the desert. And I'm standing in front of these photographs as a young, impressionable um, postgraduate student and I just had an epiphany, like this is the kind of work I wanted to do. Unfortunately. I am not that, I am not Richard Mizrock. I am a homebody. I do not like to travel. I do not like to, uh, I mean, sure, I like to travel, but not like this. And I prefer just to stay, you know, in my car doing drive by photographs rather than pulling off the side of the road and shooting. So I'm much more um, in my head than anywhere else. I grew up in a very small town in um, uh, rural western Kansas called Norton, Kansas. And we had a population of 3,500 people in my, in my hometown. So we had two stoplights, one that went through all three colors and one that just blinked red nonstop. So my childhood is more about Mother Nature and bad weather. This is a very typical of, of uh, the things that we'd experience. And as a, as a child, I've actually been through um, uh, tornadoes, uh, floods, um, blizzards, and now living in Brooklyn, um, hurricanes. So a little bit of everything throughout throughout my life. And I've taken these experiences and I've recreated them in miniature form. Insect infestations happen, you know, on a seasonal basis. So like the summer starts off with the June bug, um, two, two weeks of June bugs. You guys ever, there's no June bugs in, in um, New York City, but they get everywhere. They get into your pajamas. They get, they just hang on your, uh, around. Um, any, I know, I grew up with like, oh, there's a June bug in my pants when I was a kid. And like, um, they, they're like moths, but they like to, they're, they're really interested in light. So they just hang on your, on your, your screen door and your, they crunch all over the ground. And then there's grasshopper season. And again, New York doesn't have grasshoppers. I don't even know if upstate New York has grasshoppers, do they? OK. But when you're walking through a field and they're like hitting you in the legs and they sting and yeah. So I'm taking these, uh, these experiences I had as a child and recreating them in miniature. And so I have been through a tornado. And the sky really does turn green before a tornado strikes. That's like one of the, one of the, the classic signs. And in western Kansas, when you hear the tornado alarms, you don't go to the basement. You go to the front porch to go, where's that tornado? Yeah. <laughs> All over the Midwest, train derailment after train derailment, not just in Seattle, which happened yesterday, but you know, lots of oil spills out in, um, out in the Midwest. And then sometimes I take great, um, uh, well, I, I, I stretch the truth a little bit. I'm a product of the 1970s, so our family car was the station wagon. I kind of missed station wagons. Now we just have, what, um, minivans? But in my day, whenever you're in the family and the kids are acting up, you can actually see like the car start rocking and the father, you know, like, gosh, God. well, at least if you were behind my family car, we'd be rocking because my dad would be like kind of beating us to like, not really beating us, but like swatting out as kids, all three of us to, to quiet down. So this is more of a typical idea of how my family would perish. We'd be in the station wagon. <laughs> We'd be in the station wagon fighting. Um, me and my brother and my sister fighting like cats and dogs. My dad would be turning around, telling his kids to be quiet. He'd turn back around. He'd see the deer in the middle of the icy road. He'd swerve to miss the deer. And off into the lake we go, complaining the entire way down. So this is all, you know, this is not Photoshop trickery. This is all through the camera. I am a very late adopter of Photoshop, so this is all still 4x5 film. 
trying to problem solve how do you how do you do these things and I just take my experiences and like run with them when I was in um, Grad school, I, I taught a photography class in southern Ohio, and it was in the middle of the uh, Wayne State National Forest in a town called Ironton. And the town next door, well, actually, Ironton, yeah, had a one of two leftover uranium extraction plants. And what they do is they take spent nuclear rods and try to extract what little uranium's left out of them before disposing of them. And because it's in a forest region, a, region, a lot of the men like to hunt deer for fun, for sport, and also for a little extra meat on the table. And when they take the deer to the check-in stations, you know, so that they can like see how old the deer are, they also test them to make sure they're still edible. Because it's just such a, such a, you know, I mean, it, whenever people go into the factory, you know, on a daily basis, they have to go through one of those counters to see how radiated they may or may not be. So it's um, kind of like the sad state of where we are in this, in this day and age. And I get a lot of inspiration because since I don't travel much, I have to get inspiration from the, um, the New York Times and from the Columbus Dispatch and just reading the newspapers. And I clip these things out. And it's just amazing how images of disaster still make very compelling um, images that we just can't stop looking at. Even things like this up in upstate New York, which is in uh, Oswego County. You know, I look at that and I think, like, if that thing caught on fire, it would burn for years. But then also now I think about, oh my God, think about the Zika. <laughs> virus and the, and the uh, uh, West Nile and all that standing water up there and I just like, ugh. So these are the things that inspire me as I'm thinking about new work. And because I read the New York Times, you know, this was called California Forest Fire. Seems like California is always on fire. And as I'm speaking, guess what? Yeah. California is on fire again. And so this is a model that it took me all summer to build. Built the trees. Uh, and I pretend that I'm the one in the um, airstream watching TV. I have no idea the fire's even raging up my valley. And this di and the, the hardest thing about working with dioramas, working in a small scale, is getting that sense of atmosphere. So I only have maybe 30 inches to work with, and I wanted to like have that feel of a fire. So the magic trick and the problem solve is a fog machine that I bought off the internet, and I love my <coughs> fog machine because it's vanilla scented, so it smells really good when I get to work with it. <laughs> And again, more experiences. I spent a couple of summers as a really bad cocktail waitress on a very sad um, riverboat in Missouri. And I, I just always remember one, looking over you know, the side of the boat before I'd hop on and just like seeing if I was going to see, what was I going to see that morning? I never saw you know, a dead body, thank God. Um, but it doesn't mean I didn't stop looking. And this is like one of my favorite photographs because of the quality of light. It's that, it's that gray, kind of like where we are now, that gray, somber overcast feeling. You may see a dead body in the water, but what I see is a carefully folded paper towel and some paint. Um, the cattails are made from the Kodak uh, cardboard that we used to get in Kodak boxes of paper, of color paper. And the um, cattails are Sculpey, which is a polymer clay. And if you get really close, you'll still see my thumbprints left over in the, uh, in the uh, clay. Those little green bunches in the back are just bunches of dill I picked up at the grocery store, just plopped down. <laughs> and the bird flying through the air is just cut out of cardboard and on a little fishing string. So I'm using shallow depth of field to kind of hide the fact, you know, all my trickery around it. And because I live in Brooklyn and I uh, worked in Manhattan for 14 years, every time I went across the the uh, Manhattan Bridge on my morning commute, I always curious what was what was below me in the East River. So I'm thinking like mafia hits, tossed cars, maybe some um, parts of, of Coney Island. And I would like to think that the USS Bounty is down there since so it's one of those ships that we've never found. So I think it's in the East River. So you can see I'm taking a lot of liberty and having a lot of fun with color. And whenever I get the chance to, to, to use my friends, I definitely do. My friend Dan built these great listening devices after I traveled out to um, New Mexico to the great listening array. And if you saw this in person, there's a, there's a tiny little hitchhiker underneath the, 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 the lamp. It's, got, she's, it's actually a she. She has, her, she has her thumb up, and she's waiting for a ride. And it's going to be the wrong ride coming to get her. <laughs> And I like to talk a lot about inspiration, what inspires the work, the kind of work that I do, besides just my childhood in western Kansas. But that childhood 
it was in the 1970s, and this is back when um, the Russia was still known as the USSR. And this is from a book that I got from our from that fabulous government agency called FEMA. Back in the day, you could actually write FEMA and get a state-by-state -state guide to risks and hazards. And everywhere that you see one of these little yellow blips is either a missile silo or an airplane factory or a chemical plant. Now, when I, when I, when I open it up to New York, pretty much the entire coast of New York is just like wiped out as far as like, you know, we're targets. Maybe not anymore, but I like to think. But this is what I grew up under. I always knew where the missile silos were when we were driving around because it would just be a chain link fence guarding nothing. And, um, you know, we went through tornado drills, fire drills, and um, nuclear bomb drills as a, as a child. And everyone has, well, I wouldn't say everyone, but a lot of farmhouses out there have their storm shelters. So, and what I think is so interesting is now that some of the, those missile silos have been decommissioned, you can actually buy them for your own um, doomsday bunker. You can have you and your closest friends all living underground. And I just think it's just like the funniest thing because this is how they're going to try to sell it to you, you know. <laughs> and what, what makes me, what makes me like laugh so hard is at the bottom is the swimming pool, which seems to have um, some, I like to think of them as sharks, but whales. And I like that the fact that they have deck chairs, as if there's suns actually going to shine all the way down at the bottom of that. But I just love this whole idea of the, the, the doomsday bunker resort. And to this day, I'm still kind of obsessed with the uh, end of the world and the, with the atomic bomb. And so I really don't know what's going to be our demise as a society. I don't know if it's going to be something like H1N1 or some crazy um, Spanish flu, Spanish influenza that gets us, or if it's going to be a, 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 an asteroid hurtling through space and Bruce Willis is too old to save us these days. <laughs> Or is it going to be something crazy like climate change in such a way that affects our whole food supply and uh, insect? Or is it, this is more likely, you know, um, mutually assured destruction? And I love this photo because it's all Photoshop. None of this is like real. This is all like faked by somebody else, like doing some, some propaganda. And so those ideas about the end of the world got me to this body of work, the city, that I started in 2005 with my partner Kathleen. And what we did is we imagined what it would be like to be like the last people walking around New York City, pre-zombie, of just how spaces will age over time once man stops taking care of them and how buildings will age. And so if you can imagine, some of these spaces are abandoned overnight. Others have been abandoned for a long, long time. And so Kathleen and I build these little dioramas, except that they're not so little, and we'll, show, we'll get to that later. And we divide our... our um, what we do according to our skills. I am more the architect, so I'm in charge of walls. I did the floor, the chairs, the cabinets, the furniture, the walls, the ceiling, the lights. And she, she's the true artist. She does all the sculpting. So she's the one who made all of the, um, all the specimen jars, the skulls, and the little models on the back in the back, the little anatomy models. And those are all based on our friends and our own personal ailments. I, I no longer have a thyroid, so my thyroid is now up on the shelf. Uh, my dad had some bad knees, so he's got a, like, we have kneecaps up on the shelf. And our friend Catherine had just gone to the gynecologist, so we have her uterus up on the shelf. So if you're so lucky, you might be uh, called out in one of our scenes. And the way we set the scale for this is there's a little plastic um, skeleton that you can barely see off to the side. And that sets the scale for the scene. So that like sets the scale, and we just burn, we just build everything else to match that one thing that we got off of Amazon, that we didn't feel like we could build realistically, and build everything to it. Now I had to get the subway just right because so many of you New Yorkers take the subway on a daily basis, and if I got this wrong, I'd be totally called out on it. So we took the B, which runs through my neighborhood, the B and the Q. We took the B to the end of the line, to Brighton Beach and um, last train, waited for everyone to get off the platform, get to exit the car, and we pulled out our cameras and started photographing everything, tape measure to measure everything to make sure I get the proportions just right, and I photographed Kathleen standing in a door so we can still get human proportions just right, and people are looking at us like we are insane. I'm surprised we didn't actually get the, the police called on us because it looked like we could be planting a bomb with our, with our tape measures. And this is a library. This is like um, probably the most popular image that we've ever done. 
It took me an entire summer to make all those books. Each of those books are carved out of foam, so they don't actually open, but they're each individual books carved out of foam, sanded, painted, and put on, put on the shelf. And it took me just two, two nights just to install all the books. So this is how I spent my summer of 2007. And we bought the, um, we bought the globe and then scaled the scene around to match that. So there's always one thing that we do buy rather than make, and that sets our scale, and we just go from there. Here was the, uh, the piano. I think it's a, it's a wind-up music box, because I knew that we couldn't make a very good um, piano. And why make it if you can actually find it sometimes? And so that sets the scale for everything else. And I get my friends to help me whenever I can. So my friend Dan made the chandeliers, so we, we call them the dandeliers. And he just says, Lori, and I don't tell him what to make. I just say, do it about the size of a softball. And then, he, like, and then like many months later, he comes with this like, light that actually lights up and works, and it's about the size of a softball. And this is the first time that we tried to force the perspective to try to get it to look a little smaller and smaller. And the hardest part about this entire scene is my cat liked to sit in the middle of the aisle amongst all those seats. So she kept knocking the, um, the chairs down. I'm really sad to this day that I never experienced Penn Station before it was torn down to put up that nasty thing, like that ugly eyesore Madison Square Garden. Have you guys, I mean, have you guys, how many of you guys, did you guys ever get to see Penn Station before it was torn down? One person, okay. So I'm trying to imagine what a beautiful um, train station might look like with fountains, and here they forgot to turn off the fountains and they froze over, and you have remnants, you have like pieces of, of, um, uh, trash that maybe look like people might have been sleeping in here. There's some mattresses discarded, some shopping carts. And the funniest thing about this is that we needed graffiti. Kathleen and I, we're in our 40s, close to getting 50. We're not graffiti people at all. So I bought her a book on the history of graffiti. And so she's there in miniature trying to learn how to tag, you know, and trying to like <laughs> become someone she's not by tagging. And we didn't want to copy other people's tags. So instead, there's like shout outs to my dad, to our cat, to our friends, just having a fun time and just feeling like total. I wouldn't say losers, but just weird, like, you know, doing fake graffiti, as two older women do. <clears throat> Botanic Garden, I live across the street from the Brooklyn Botanic Garden. I'm always just curious what it might look like if they let the plants interbreed, if like, we're no longer there, like pruning and, and, and um, carefully cultivating them, if they just don't um, combine DNA and make into something else. And so this is a combination of a lot of paper, some plastic plants, a few live plants, a little bit of everything. And this scene confused my cats, because my cats are indoor cats. So we'd come home from work, and they'd be sitting in the middle of this paper and plastic jungle, thinking that they were back in nature themselves. It doesn't matter where you go in the United States, all laundromats look the same. This particular model is about 18 inches wide, and I'd say 27 inches deep. Uh, we, we bought the fluorescent lights, and that kind of set the scale for everything else. Everything here has been manufactured by us, except for the miniature um, cactus in the back. So that's the one thing that actually exists in real life. And we were so enamored of our, of our fluorescent lights, I just had to do a nighttime scene, because I have spent too many Friday and Saturday nights at the laundromat listening to those lights buzz, you know, just feeling sorry for myself that I'm doing my laundry on a Saturday night. And because it's New York, you have to have rats running amok when you're doing this. Do you guys remember a couple of years ago, the, I don't know if you saw this, the video that a tourist had shot of the interior? No, this is even pre-Pizza Rat. This is, this is one of those Kentucky Fried Chicken slash Taco Bell restaurants, and there are like, tourists out looking at it, and I swear there was like 30 rats running around like crazy. That place no longer exists. I think that's why we have the A, B, C, D. Um, uh, not really, but I think that's one of the reasons why we have that um, restaurant grade now. And when we're, when we're making these, I don't want them to just be so New York identified. Here I'm trying to channel Miami. So you have that, you have that humidity, the greenery, it's, it's, it's vacuums being sold to my grandparents, they're old fashioned. And um, this is one of our favorite scenes. We had a lot of fun doing that because sometimes advertising uh, takes, um, borrows ideas from um, fine art 
from historical paintings. And so the posters that are selling the vacuums all are having, um, using uh, famous paintings. So it's like, you know, there's um, Da Vinci with his hand, like when he, um, God's creating, you know, the son of God. So instead you have God creating the most classic vacuum. And the next one after that is Magritte, where it's raining vacuums through the sky. And the next poster is um, Van Gogh. The vacuum is so powerful, it's sucking the stars right out of starry, starry sky. <laughs> and my last one, which didn't make it to the wall because I'm really bad at math, is um, Deschamps' vacuum descending a staircase. <laughs> For four, my first 14 years here in New York City, I worked at a, at a color photo lab called LTI, and my job was to uh, do color contacts of, of a client's work and um, print murals. And one of our clients was Robert Polidori, who was a fabulous um, photographer, and he was the first American photographer led into Chernobyl to photograph the interior insides of, of um, Chernobyl, and when he was there, and, and I was so lucky to do all of his contact sheets, so he came back, and when, when I got to do them, all of the all of the um, gauges and all the wires had been ripped out of, of all that machinery, so someone had already gone in there and stolen all the copper wiring. And he was only allowed to go in for 15 minutes at a time, I believe, and it could have been 20, but he'd have to go in, take a few photos, and then like run outside as if outside is less nuclear than the inside, you know? And I do remember him saying that he just felt so, he just felt not so good for like the, last, the next year of his life because it was just such a contaminated space. And I just think hearing all those stories and thinking about it, I did my own running with the idea and built my own control room. And this are um, made from like the backs of earrings, um, some pins, some um, stuff that they sell to you for scrapbooking, and googly eyes, you know the little googly eyes? Those are the, my lenses for all of these dials. And so, you know, we take everyday things and objects that we see and try to recreate them into something a little more insidious and industrial. This is an almost abs absolute replica of my living room. This just happens to be a cleaner version of it. We do all of our model building, or we used to do all of our model building in our living room. And so when I was doing the living room, um, I was actually working on the subway at the same time. And it's very important to me, less so to Kathleen, but to me to get everything as perfect as possible. I actually pulled all the books off my bookshelf and flatbed scanned each one of them and put them back in the, uh, in the shelves exactly how they were to be. And each CD that I had, I made sure that it was on the shelf. Not that you guys will ever see it, because there's some really embarrassing CDs in my collection, but I know they're there, and that's what really matters to me, is to get everything as perfect as possible. And this mall used to exist in Columbus, Ohio. Um, it was like the shopping place for years, and I was ready to like fly back to Columbus and visit it so I could imagine what it would be like as a defunct mall. And so when I called my friend Carrie, he said, hey, I want to come back and go to city center. She goes, oh, honey, that place has been raised. That's now a public park. And it's like, yes. So I was really excited about that. And this kind of gets you a sense of space. So this is one of our biggest scenes that we've done. So that mall is still considered dollhouse scale, so it's 1 to 12. So if I was to stand inside the mall, I would be 5 inches tall. But because it's a three-story mall, it just grows exponentially larger and larger. So the mall ended up being 10 feet wide, 9 feet deep, and that's Kathleen sitting in the middle of it, starting her, you know, working on it, doing some of her um, uh, techniques to age it and make it look more decrepit than it really is. And that subway that I showed you earlier is actually quite large. It's eight feet long by 24 inches wide, and she's the only one who can actually crawl in there and, and, and uh, install the little greasy poles that we all like to not like to hang on to. And this beauty shop, if, if this was New York, it'd be called Hair Salon, but because this is the beauty shop of my childhood of Norton, Kansas, it's beauty shop. It's a much smaller scene, and there you get a sense of how, of how intimate it really can be. Monster hand coming in. <laughs> 
and this is the inspiration. There's a Chinese restaurant in my in my in my neighborhood, and every time I felt like going, I, I went in there. I felt like it was the end of the world because there's like that greasy bulletproof glass that keeps you from the from the person serving it. And so I wanted to recreate this in in miniature. First, I had to talk Kathleen into it. There was a big negotiation because she didn't think it was going to be a very good idea because it just bored her to death. Until we needed to make the menu board. She's gluten free which means that I just couldn't go out and buy the Chinese food and replate it because then that's a lot of Chinese food for one person to eat. And, um, and she couldn't touch any of it because it contains uh, soy and gluten. So we had to recreate, well, she recreated all these plates in miniature. So this is Mugu Gai Pan. And to give you an idea of the scale of her Mugu Gai Pan right next to her pencil. And I needed these plates of food so that we could create the menu board so that we could really create the menu board. And in my neighborhood, chicken wings with french fries is the number one selling uh, <laughs> I am at the, at the Chinese food place. So this is our rendition of what it looked like. And I wish I could go back and just make it a little more greasy and a little more um, lived in than it really, than it showed up here. But I had a show the next day. Well, I had a show within a week and I had to hurry up and deliver this to the gallery. So I didn't get to make it as, as great as I really wanted to. I actually have a show up right now in a gallery here in New York City called Clamp Art. Um, and it's not too far from here. It's at, uh, just in case you guys ask, it is at 247 West 29th Street. So it's right down 29th between 8th and 7th Avenue. And the next body of work, yeah, 49th, yeah, no, no, 29th, 29th, down, downtown, well, down from here at least. So again, I'm taking inspirations from our surroundings, and I think you've all, we've all been aware the last couple, like, I'd say seven, eight years, ten years, things just haven't quite felt as positive as they, we was hoping they would be. And um, so I took this idea of the Brooklyn, um, of the Grand Army Plaza, which is, a, which is the uh, triumphal arch of the north at, um, over the south. And it's the weirdest sculpture I've ever seen in Brooklyn, actually in New York, because you have this triumphal arch, and in the front are soldiers and slaves, and in the background are, are Roman soldiers, which I'm not quite sure how the Roman soldiers play into the, all of the idea of, of uh, the Civil War. But I wanted it, and I and I and I and I wanted to make my own. So we we constructed our own um, triumphal arch, taking inspiration from Grand Army Plaza. And because I only could find access to uh, World War One and World War Two figures, I recreated more of a contemporary idea of a, of a triumphal arch. And as I'm doing this body of work, there's a lot of failure involved. This is my first attempt at shooting the arch and I'm not happy with it. It's just not what I really wanted it to be. So we recreated it a second time and decided it could be a little bit more dramatic, a little more pizzazz. And so this is uh, my second recreation. So this particular body work called Empire is more about failure than anything else. And here, the, empire, the arch says, defenders of the empire. So it's a little bit more vague about who's winning, who's losing, and um, who's triumphing over, over what. And now it's time for the next body, the next image is called Dawn. And you can see this is kind of like how the buildings look as they're being set up. And I know I wanted birds to fly through the air, so Kathleen made this great model bird that we would photograph its wings in various positions, as you'll see and see why. And this is my first attempt at it, and it's just really lacking what I really wanted it to look like. And my second attempt at it, it's not quite there yet. It's just like, oh, not, no, I'm gonna kind of keep reshooting it until I get it just right. And this is the one that I could actually live with. So this is like the fourth attempt on creating this scene, how I'm wanting it, and how I could live with it for the next, for the rest of my life. So as you can see, fail, 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 and then finally, something I can live with. I am a fan of hot dogs. I love New York City hot dogs. I actually think Chicago dogs are even better. So this is a Chicago hot dog. If you ever get to travel to West Virginia, this is a West Virginia hot dog. It's chili with um, coleslaw. And why am I showing you guys hot dogs? Because I'm obsessed with the hot dog carts that are all throughout 
New York City. And because I see them on a daily, you know, on a daily basis, I had to recreate them as my own. So in the studio, I created my own abandoned nasty little hot dog cart. I call it my Hep C cart. <laughs> and this is our first attempt at creating like an idea of abandoned hot dog carts, and it's okay, but I think it could actually be a little bit better. So I'm going to give it another try. So instead, I started thinking about Greek mythology and the idea of sirens, these beautiful women, you know, using song and, 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 and poetry and beauty to, to, to lure sailors' ships up onto, the, up onto the rocks to their demise. And I kind of feel that the hot dog carts are my sirens in a way. So I asked Kathleen, can you like sculpt me you know, an amazing um, fountain? So she said, sure. So she gets out her sculpey and starts sculpting away. And so, you know, there we are working at it. And these scenes take us a while. They take about seven months to make. So this isn't just happening overnight. And so here's our second rendition. Actually, this is our third attempt at when I like hot dog carts. And unfortunately, I had to put the sign that says hot dog cart on the side of the cart because I was a little surprised at how people don't actually know what a hot dog cart looks like. You know? And I was up in Greenwich, Connecticut, and someone said, what is that? And it's like, it's a hot dog cart. I mean, you, you, must, you must pass by them as you're like taking your town car into the city, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to like give a little, a, little, a little extra oomph to go away. And I like the idea of New York City and how there's this entire city, sub-city right below us, all those um, subway stations. And um, you know, when you go to a restaurant, your food's being prepared in the basement. Being, that, that's, that doesn't happen in Kansas City. There's no such thing as like things being chopped up in the basement underneath the sidewalk. That's a New York experience unto itself. And the idea of like you know sinkholes all over the city and infrastructure. And I think there's a sinkhole that just opened up recently. I'm not sure. I haven't been on the local newspaper lately. And so I kind of took that idea of, of New York and streets just sinking and how you see the, the um, pipes, the infrastructure below it. And this is my first attempt at it. But it's the most obvious approach to the image where you're just shooting right up the middle of the crack. And it's just like, yeah, it's OK, but it's not, it's not there yet. So we redid it one more time. And so this is what the image that I had more in my mind. So this is our final image for this one called Rift. And I was asked by, we were asked by a museum in Kansas City to create a, to create a, a scene for their um, a benefit auction. And we were given the task of using silver. Silver was the, was the one thing that we had to use. So we came up with the idea of the coin-operated viewer looking at our national monuments. And just because of the times that we are living in, the way that we strip mine and um, just abuse the land to get whatever resources we want out of it without thinking of long-term projects. And the whole idea of notion of China just like really ramping up and becoming this whole other country over the last um, 15, 20 years. And their idea, this is called a nail house, which is where there's that one person who holds out, who doesn't want to leave their home. So what do they do? They strip everything else around it and will build cities right up around it. So look, nail house, that's just amazing. And they're like, you know, that's one formidable person who can have that happen for them. And the idea that our national parks could easily be put up for sale all over again as far as like the natural resources that are in them. So this is how I kind of see the future. The idea of the national monument, um, of Monument Valley going for sale to the highest bidder. So this could be what our national parks might look like, you know, in the not so distant future where, you know, they'll leave the beauty but still rape the land right below it. And if, you have, if it happens in the fall, then it also happens in the winter time. <laughs> um, I'm just listening to the, yeah. And um, I love brutalist architecture. I think it's like, so ugly and so fascinating at the same time. This is a Goshen, New York. This is a, a government building that has now been torn down. But this is by a famous um, architect of the day. Uh, a gov and, and I love that, well, I don't really love it. Um, brutalist architecture is usually left for um, housing, government, and universities. This is the learning center up in Albany, New York. And I just think that that's just an amazing building, all that concrete. And it just looks like no other building I've ever seen. 
So I'm running with my own idea of brutalist architecture. And this is like one of those ideas that just didn't quite pan out. This is Paris. This is, um, this is a housing uh, development, apartment buildings in Paris that I'm sure they looked great when they first opened, but no one's taking care of them now. So they end up looking like this bit of an eyesore. And this is a famous hotel in Tokyo, which, you know, when it first opened, I'm sure it looked great, but now it just looks like discarded uh, washing machines. <laughs> Doesn't mean I still wouldn't want to live there. I think it's really kind of cool. I always wanted to have a circular window. So I took my whole idea of brutalist architecture and government and, and housing and cities, and we made this. And it's just like, ah, uh, it's, it's OK. But it's not quite what we want. I'm not really getting a sense of space. You don't really get a sense of like this being a large city block. So we created it a couple of times until we came up with this idea. And this is called Utopia, which is like those ideas of you know life is going to be good, but not quite so if we just let time run with it. And this used to be our, our idea of, um, of fake news. Back in the day, you know, I love that, and I kind of wish we could go back to these charming days of fake news. And instead, this is how I am at the computer. You know, you know, please be fake, please be fake, please be fake. And instead, that's not quite the case. And so, I'm just imagining standing on a corner, and I took the inspiration from being down on Canal Street and just kind of like looking around Canal Street with these ideas of, you know, the city is is, is decimated. Our I mean, is 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 empty. Our journalism has 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 um, gone to rot. There's no more uh, great journalism going on. And I don't know if you guys. I'm of a certain age where we used to watch Hee Haw as a, as a small child. And there's a song called Gloom, Despair, Agony on Me. And I just wanted to give it a little bit of a twist of French. So that was like a more of a shout out to my, to my dad and my roots of um, early 70s television. And last and least, I love um, walking around New York City and looking at all of the infrastructure, the highways. And you know, when, you're, when you're driving from upstate and you're coming back into the city, you pass under all these roads. And it's just an amazing thing that's fleeting. You, you can't really look at it for very long because you're just trying to white knuckle it as you're driving back into the city, trying to be safe. And this is, this is, this is China. This is like one of those crazy um, rail, uh, road exchanges happening in China. I love that it's still empty. Kind of interesting, huh? And so I took that idea of my own overpasses and I made this one. And again, it's OK. It's not quite what I had in mind. It's not quite the vision I wanted. So in the last minute, I decided to redo it one more time to come up with this. And so this, to me, is the successful one. This is the one that didn't fail. And with that, I believe we are done with my lecture. Mm -hmm.